I'd like to call into order the Salt Hill School Committee open meeting of Wednesday, April 11th, 2018. And first item on the agenda is special recognition. Well, this is a time that we um, really take pause <coughs> to celebrate and recognize the incredible contribution of um, our school committee members. And unfortunately for us, but I can see you're smiling <laughs> after many years of um, serving the Southboro School Committee well and the school district, um, that we have to say you're moving on. Yes. And well, it's it's time and Jerry as well so this is a little um, different scenario because generally the chair takes the lead but I think Paul is the next in seniority and I would ask <laughs> if, if Paul would like to um, join me in the presentation sure <laughs> Roger are you okay with that absolutely is it most seniority? <laughs> okay so again from all of us to both of you, we give you our um, deepest heartfelt thanks and appreciation for all that you have done for the South Pro School, the South Pro Schools. Um, the number of years that you have served, the numerous issues that you have championed uh, along the way in celebration of our students and our teachers and our administrators have probably been far more numerous than we could mention. Uh, the challenges that were before you uh, most recently and certain through the years and your steadfast commitment to our to education and to our students is just tremendous. And um, I don't know how we're going to replace both of you in the roles that you've taken on, given up your personal time, um, and um, left your family alone many nights as our school committee meetings have gone on. Um, I'm sure has been a commitment that's been a family commitment, and so we recognize their contributions as well. And so we do have a few. Um, parting gifts and those who would also like to recognize all the work that you've done. Well, I don't know if you want to say a few words as well as sure. a colleague, a community colleague. Just starting with Mary Beth who's been here 15 years? My 15th school year. Yeah. Wow. Served as yeah. mentor to uh, all kinds of school committee members including myself. I think one of the first things I did was go over to Mary Beth's house and she explained to me what the school committee does. And, uh, and it was just a very big help to me, and her, her institutional knowledge has been really valuable all, all these years, and uh, you'll be missed. <coughs> and, and Jerry uh, came along at a, a rather challenging time when he was talking about closing schools, and, uh, and he dove right in and had a, a real affinity for numbers that was very helpful, and, uh, and just level head, and, and it's been <coughs> just an outstanding member for, for six years. And, we appreciate all your, your dedication for the both of you. So thanks so much. And we have a couple messages um, to send your way from both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Oh, oh do you want me to? <laughs> I can read and you can shake. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <I'll just laughs> <read. laughs> um, to Mary Beth Strickland. Be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Mary Beth R. Strickland in, in, in recognition of your dedicated service to the town of Southboro as vice chair of the Southboro School Committee. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavor. Presented this day, April 11th at the State House, Boston, Massachusetts, signed by Robert A. DeLeo, Speaker of the House, and none other than our own state rep, Carolyn Wonder, who has Carol certainly been a partner with you for all these years. So that is yeah. the first. And the State Senate, not to be outdone <coughs> with even bigger font, <laughs> um, is the official citation. Be it known that the Massachusetts Senate hereby extends its congratulations to Mary Beth R. Strickland, in recognition of your dedicated service as a member of the South Grove School Committee and be it further known that the Massachusetts Senate extends its best wishes for continued success, that this citation be duly signed by the President of the Senate and attested to and a copy of, therefore transmitted by the Clerk of the Senate. And Harriet Chandler, as we know, is you know just in the, the next neighborhood. 
She is the um, current serving president of the Senate, so it's nice to have somebody nearby that knows that district signing this document. And um, also presented by William F. Welch and James B. Welch. Okay. Thank you. But wait, but wait. <laughs> that is yeah, not there's enough. more. <laughs> At a this local level, you have the much coveted uh, clock. clock that you will never have to time yourself <laughs> with uh, being present or a little late okay. or early for the next meetings. And also, I think something that really symbolizes <coughs> um, education, and it's the core of the work that you've provided on our behalf for so many years, and that's our crystal apple. There is no other crystal like any other, sort of like a snowflake, and you two are no, like no other member that we will have on the school committee. Thank oh, you so much. Thank you. Speech. Speech. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I would just say it's, it's been a privilege to, to be on this committee all these years. Um, and I've often had people kind of say to me, "How could you do this so long? You've done, you know." But I think it's because it's been such a wonderful environment of respect and I think it's been a privilege to work with the administration, with the um, principals, with the staff and I think there's always been a level of respect um, and I think that because I've worked in such a district where I feel like everybody, the school committee, the administration, the teachers, the main focus has always been the kids here so there's it, the politics aside, you know, you hear talking to other school committee members or reading, and I felt like everybody's always had a common goal here. And I think that's why I could sort of keep doing this for so long, because I felt that commitment to that. So I thank you all. And I would like to thank Mary Beth. She basically um, helped me grow roots in my role as superintendent. She was already on the committee. And I just want to thank you for your guidance and your wisdom and your humor and through some <laughs> challenging moments, and it's very much appreciated. And Paul, did you do you want to come up again? You're doing a fine job. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we also have someone else uh, bidding us a fine ado, and again, um, Jerry has been. I think you came on board right when I was transitioning, and mm -hmm. I remember yeah, in the office with uh, Charles, both of us becoming. Uh, more familiar with our new positions and um, chatting a little bit about the challenges before us and I want to thank you as well for your um, steadfast support and your guidance and your perspective that has always brought about a, just as perspectives would a new way of looking at every situation and oftentimes very much um, shed, a, shed some very valuable light on, on all of the topics that we've had to discuss over the years. You will be greatly missed in your oh, own chair and you certainly too. your wisdom as a committee member. And we appreciate all that you've done in the time that you've been with us. And the Senate and the House, they've been very busy. <laughs> <laughs> and not to be outdone, we will have stopped. the Senate presentation. And uh, this is presented to Gerald V. Capra, again, first the middle initial there. State Senate official citation, be it known that the Massachusetts Senate hereby extends its congratulations to Jerry V. Capra in recognition of your dedicated service as a member of the South Grove School Committee and be it further known that the Massachusetts Senate extends its best wishes for continued success that this citation be duly signed by the President of the Senate and attested to and a copy thereof transmitted by the Clerk of the Senate. Signed by Harriet L. Chandler. And the House. Commonwealth of Massachusetts House of Representatives, be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Gerald V. Capra in recognition of your dedicated service to the town of Southboro as chair of the Southboro School Committee. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors presented this 11th day of April, Robin A. DeLeo, Speaker of the House, and Carolyn Dykema. She's everywhere. <laughs> she is everywhere. She is everywhere. <laughs> she really is. Yeah, she is. Congratulations. That's what you're getting. 
<laughs> Guess what you're getting. And uh, time marches on, and we say hello and we say goodbye, and unfortunately, we're saying um, see you later and somewhere this evening. And um, again, we hope that you do not look at this um, too often as you travel through the future. And um, you certainly won't have to worry about being here at 6.30 on Wednesday, the second Wednesday of the month for a while, unless we're always looking for an audience. You'd like to be part of the audience. Dave Finneran would love some company. <laughs> <laughs> And again, the highest recognition that we bestow on retiring members of our school community is the Crystal Apple. Um, education is the core of our work, and we've certainly been at the core of many conversations that have led us and uh, guided us in our work with our students and staff. So thank you very much. We should open our app. We can put our app Down the beach, a speech, and around the Um, first, I, would, I just want to thank everyone. It's really been, I think, a great experience for me, and, uh, and I'm working with some of the nicest people. And, and a, a couple of people I wanted to mention is Mary Beth, who taught me everything I knew the, for that first couple of weeks. You have been here forever. And Paul <laughs> also for actually convincing me to even run Thanks, at the yeah. time. And, and so th I just want to just give special thanks to them. And, and then my final thanks really is to the, um, the citizens of Southwood who were kind enough to elect me to this office. Okay, and allow me to serve over the last six years, and I, I'm very appreciative of, of, for that also. So, but again, thank you everybody, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'll be seeing you around somewhere. <laughs> so, and no recognition would be complete without cake, and there is a cake. It's behind the bookshelf, so we can either partake now or um, have a very um, sweet closing to the meeting today, and it's the will of the committee. Sweet closing. I say sweet clothes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just <laughs> ate. <laughs> some years. Because then we would get two cakes. Two cakes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what we two apples, just need. Two apples, one cake. <laughs> oh, yeah. Harry nice. Potter. Yeah. Doesn't it look like a Harry Potter apple? <coughs> okay. It's a puzzle. It is a puzzle. It's not Rubik's cute. It's not cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an engineer. I'll do that later. <laughs> that's that's the final that's test. We have to watch you. Jerry, that's what you can do with your time. Yeah. 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's got to be on the school party for 15 years to figure that out. Well, the next item on the agenda is audience sharing. Because looking around this table, um, I don't think any of us would be here without Mary Beth. I know I certainly would. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Because I strong-armed her into it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. pretty much. <laughs> but the reason that you were able to strong-arm me into it is because, I think because of your um, leadership and just great spirit and personality, I mean, you transformed this school committee. And nobody, well, maybe a couple of you do remember, um, there were some years that it was, you know, when we were trying to get a new, our own high school, I mean, there were some really turbulent times in Southboro. Mm -hmm. And I had always said, I'm not going to be a part of that. But Mary Beth convinced me. She says, we've, we've got a kinder, gentler school committee now. And she was right. And one of the reasons for that is because of her. And a few so others. because yeah, so I joined, then I pulled other people in, and then 
we both targeted Paul because you went up to the dead town meeting and you said, why can't we raise the school budget? We're like, we want him on the <laughs> And so, and because Paul is here, then you know, the rest of you are here, and every single other person at this table has been touched because Mary Beth is not, has been on almost every screening committee. But um, if she wasn't on the specific screening committee, certainly she trained the other people of how to be a really effective um, and fair and, you know, just excellent screening committee member. So, that came from Sue Target. Oh, yeah, but oh, you know what? You, you but you you also outlived yeah. us all, right? right. Except for you guys, us. who are assistant principals. You have outlived everybody in administration, <laughs> other school. You live, outlived me. <laughs> so, um, so thank you, Mary Beth. You are like the mother of Southboro School Committee, current school committee, and uh, I know I appreciate the experience that I had. I appreciate knowing all of you people, except the people I don't know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we met before. <laughs> um, but, uh, but thank you very much. And Jerry, thank you very much for your um, just unbelievable, you have such a great calm demeanor that even when things were, you know, getting exciting for whatever reason, you were just there. You're just like the Energizer Bunny. You just, you know, kept on ticking, and you didn't ever get excited about things, and you kept everything calm, and your years as, as chair have been really, really helpful for just, you know, continuing on in that, in, that, um, in that vein. And I think that you are all doing a great service to the Southboro town, and I hope that everybody who comes in after you guys are, um, are, are just as competent and... Uh, just terrific people. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Is there any more audience sharing? Yep. Good evening, Teachers Association, and I need to get up and say thank you on behalf of all the teachers and staff in the district for your years and years of service, um, your dedication and commitment to fight for what we need in schools. Didn't go unnoticed, and we great. So enjoy your time, and thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. And anyone else? <laughs> okay, so we can move to the first item under new business, which is the technology update. If you're on region committee, if you're at the regional committee or combined, you've probably um, met this individual because Julie Doyle is everywhere um, and everything about technology. We are very fortunate that she um, decided in uh, January to transition from her very visible and important role as the instructional technology leader at Algonquin Regional High School into a more um, district-wide um, position that will allow her <coughs> talents to be shared and her knowledge and expertise in technology and um, instructional technology learning to, um, to all of the students throughout uh, the K-12 system. So this evening, Julie will share with you some of the conversations that she's had as she expands her, hori her horizons and gets to know a little bit more um, and become familiar with all of our schools in our district. And that is probably the most sunshine we've seen <laughs> and color we've seen in uh, some weeks. So what a great way to, to kick off your presentation. Welcome to uh, the first of, I'm sure, what will be many visits here. Thank you. Glad to have you here. So um, I just wanted to take a little time tonight to introduce myself and to um, talk a little bit about my new role as the Director of Instructional Technology and Digital Learning. That's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, first, a little bit about my background. So I've lived in Northborough since uh, 1999. I am the proud mother of three Algonquin graduates. Uh, I have been an educator for over 20 years. Many of those years uh, spent teaching high school math. Some of those years teaching high school math at a private high school. Uh, but most of those years teaching high school math at Algonquin. And in fact, I had the absolute privilege of teaching all of the Strickland kids <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> um, so um, my last four years have been spent as the instructional technology teacher at Algonquin. 
um, I'm very excited about my new position and to be able to share my passion uh, for educational technology with all the schools of the district. So in this new role, my focus will be to provide the necessary resources and training in order to make teachers feel comfortable to embed technology into their curriculum. I'll be working very closely with the district technology managers to ensure that uh, building infrastructure and hardware uh, support learning initiatives. So technology can never replace good teaching. Um, teachers need to integrate technology seamlessly into the curriculum, not as an add-on or an afterthought. Um, technology should enhance lessons, it should transform the learning. And if used correctly, it could empower our students to be self-directed learners, to be more creative and more connected. Um, in case you're wondering who George Kuros is, he is a innovative teaching um, leadership and learning uh, consultant. I've heard him speak at a, a few conferences and he's, he's fabulous. He ha he's also um, published a couple books, if you ever see his name around. So over the last few months, I've um, been learning about all the various aspects of this job. I've had the opportunity to meet with the principals from uh, Finn and Woodward, Neary and Trottier to discuss uh, their current and future educational technology goals. And as you heard earlier, most of my professional experience has been at the high school level. But, so I know I have a lot to learn about K to eight curriculum and technology, but I feel as though my high school experience will help. As a teacher at the high school, I was able to observe how prepared our students were entering the high school, but I was also able to observe maybe where some of the gaps in preparation were. So for this and this reason, and, and um, I think it's really important too to, to provide collaboration time um, across schools and grade levels for teachers to help to smooth the transition um, from grade to grade and also to help to vertically and horizontally align curriculum and instruction. So a good example of sort of that cross collaboration between schools and grade levels is our decision to start to use Canvas at the, um, the middle school. Canvas is the learning management system that we recently adopted at Algonquin. And this uh, year, since January, there have been a few teachers at Trottier who are piloting um, Canvas to help to smooth the transition to the full implementation of Canvas next year. Canvas is um, a way to simplify teaching and learning. It places all the digital tools that teachers use in one simple place. It is a great tool for collaboration and communication. It can help students stay um, more organized. It can help to provide um, faster and more valuable feedback. So we've had a really successful year using Canvas at the high school and by expanding its use um, to the middle schools where we're helping to prepare those middle school students for, for high school. Um, the teaching and learning that's going on uh, in the tech ed classes at Trottier is another really good example of a technology initiative. They are using the engineering designing process and embedding science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, into um, their curriculum. They brainstorm ideas of what to create, they use computer-aided design, and then print out 3D models of their prototypes. They are learning about things like the physics behind bridge building and how engineers design cars for safety. This year at Neary, the instructional technology teacher and the librarian um, have combined library technology and the 21st century skills of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity uh, to create a class called Libratory. Uh, during this class, uh, the students are participating in multiple STREAM center-based activities. Now STREAM stands for Science, Technology, Reading and Research, Engineering, Arts and Mathematics. 
in the picture, you can see some NERI students using the Osmos in another classroom setting. After a very successful fundraising campaign, NERI was able to purchase 11 classroom sets. I think there's still this <coughs> more to be purchased. Three more to right? Mm -hmm. um, so these are their game systems that work in conjunction with the iPads and their one-to-one -one iPads over at NERI. Um, when they're using the Osmos, they're engaged in active learning and they're also working on their creative problem solving skills. Teachers at Neary and at Woodward um, are using a new parent communication tool this year, um, and it's called Seesaw. Um, Seesaw is um, a way, it gives families immediate and personalized window into their child's school day. Uh, and it also makes communication between parents and teachers seamless. Uh, during one of my recent visits to Woodward, I observed the use of Seesaw in a third grade classroom. And there were, kids had made short videos to describe the difference between the words there, there, and there. You guys know those three words that I'm talking about? Um, so they, were, they made the videos and they were able to share them on the app really quickly with their families. Uh, one of the technology goals for next year is to expand the use of this great communication tool. Um, in this picture, there are students working with Root robots. Root is a wall driving, music playing, artwork drawing robot that turns paper or a whiteboard into an intuitive and interactive coding experience. Currently, Woodward has 10 pre-production routes that they um, are using with the second and third graders. The instructional technology specialist is working with the teachers to figure out ways to integrate this technology. And I know counting money is um, an early math skill and it's part of the math curriculum. So um, the kids are learning how to code root to navigate through a maze and to gather up different types of coins and then to add up their value. At Finn, they hope to improve on their current practices of embedding coding and the use of the B-Bots into classroom learning. B-Bots are little robots that are designed for use by young children. They are easy to operate and a perfect tool for teaching directionality, estimation, sequencing, and problem solving. In kindergarten, students have a unit where they learn about their communities and the Finn kindergartners are, are learning how to code the B-Bots to move around a laminated map and to locate significant places in their community like the fire station, the town hall, the library. Another technology goal at Finn is to choose an effective communication tool like Seesaw. So as you can see, there is all sorts of great, exciting, tech integration going on in the self Grow schools. Instructional technology encompasses so much. What I spoke about earlier and this diagram are just a few of the many focus areas. Teachers and instructional technology coaches need to always be mindful though of the importance of embedding technology into pre-existing curriculum to transform the learning. In order for our students to be successful, we want them to effectively read, write, think, analyze, problem solve. We want to use technology to help them master those essential cognitive skills. We also would like our educators to teach kids to engage <coughs> safely and responsibly with technology so they can acquire those 21st century skills they need to succeed in college, career, and life. Well done. Does anyone have any questions? One thing I wanted to note is just in the first time I dealt with the schools with technology was about six years ago, but just how far we've come. Mm -hmm. I mean, just seeing the presentation and the way that you're explaining it and the way that you pull the whole thing together, we have come a very, very long way from back when I first looked at this with the school committee six years ago. So I, I, I really thank you for really pulling it all together because I, I just remember there was at one point there where we were just, it was very confused and 
and we were looking at um, iPads and you know it, you know we, we were very kind of very just focused on one little thing you know, and, and obviously we're not there anymore we're, we're, we have a real comprehensive understanding of what we're trying to accomplish so again it's, it's just a lot of things and, I, and we've really done a lot oh great thanks yeah I'm really excited to keep moving forward with, yeah. with that I just have kind of like a general big picture so it, um, I guess I, I, this is amazing all the things that are being done like what percentage of the way are we there in terms of what we envision for integration into the classroom because I mean this these are wonderful programs I just I have, I have a hard time sort of picturing sort of what the optimal yeah, and looks like. that's a, that's an excellent question. I think uh, I don't know if we'll ever reach that that optimal setting. Yeah. And you know, for me, I, I'm mostly aware of what's what's going on at the high school, and I'm just starting to learn it. What's going on, Kate? Um, and we have pockets of of absolute high flyers with with technology. Those would be the teachers, and then we have some who are sort of middle range, and then we have some who are still learning. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope you know in my tenure here that I can sort of bring everyone up to that that level um, you know they, they talk about our kids being digital natives and this is the way kids learn um, so you know we want to be mindful of, of not just assuming that kids know everything about technology but we also want to meet them where they're at and and provide them with so many cool opportunities that technology can provide for them that that they couldn't that couldn't happen before like Skyping with a group of kids in France, or um, you know, <coughs> just you know, creating videos just on the fly and sharing those videos, and there's just so many cool things that kids can do. But right, and super important to just continue to embed that into the existing curriculum because ultimately they still need to know how to communicate and write and think, and we don't want it to just be this extra add-on fun thing, and then we want to be mindful of, of safety too. Um, so. What percentage? That's 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 hard for me to judge, yeah. but okay. that's, that's a good question. And I guess as a follow-up, are there are there major sort of categories of technology that will be needed in order to implement the things to bring us to an sure. even further level, or yeah. is it? I think we're in a. Are you talking about hardware? And yeah, yeah, we're in yeah, a really like good investment. place right now. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, especially the South Pro schools. Okay. Um, we, uh, I think, are well equipped. And, and our focus really needs to be on how to use the equipment we have and how to keep it updated. But for now, we, I, I think, based on my experience with uh, you know, going to conferences and learning what's happening at other schools, uh, yeah, I think right. until something else, they create something else you know, that, <laughs> that you can wear and that you can just think about what, what it should do and it'll do it for you. We don't have any of those yet, but right. uh, yeah. Okay. For now, we're in a good place. I was going to say that one of our measurements, well, it still kind of is a measurement, was, was um, how many units we had, you know, in, in the schools for students. And, and so that was the main way that we tried to measure yeah. is we, um, we, we didn't measure some of the other things that are being done there, but we wanted to make sure that, that as many students as possible had access to technology. Yeah. So, that, so that was the main thing that we tried to do, I think, as a school committee, was to make sure the funds were there to do that. Mm -hmm. And then um, to have the school go off and put together the plan <coughs> to improve achievement. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but I think the I think that's what's been the the six years difference is mm -hmm. that it's not technology for the sake of having the technology; it's having the right technology, having the right apps, and not superseding the learning. Making yeah. sure it's it's a um, accenting the learning or just helping it as opposed to. I think uh, you know just the creation of this particular job. You know, we before had a director of technology, and um, you know the the focus on the instructional piece is is a priority for the district. So I think that's uh, important as well. And I I'm also wondering about the um, the digital literacy certificate that I think at some point all the t is is there a time in the, frame in the, for in that where that's everybody still just in the work of the varying levels. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're still exploring that option. Okay. I think you presented some great modules, though. Um, Julie was actually part of the development of the first um, few modules that we were creating for our teachers, mm -hmm. yep. and uh, presented to the NASA team at one of our retreat uh, workshops, I think, last year, so that we could actually try out mm 
um, in our, our very novice way, some mm -hmm. of us, not those across the table from me, but um, some of us, and uh, just work through those modules to see how uh, readily accessible the information was for us to then take from that experience and utilize and apply in our own work setting. So I think we have about four or five modules we created do, uh, yeah, for that already to, to work super on. Super important for those modules to stay current and things change constantly. So that's, that's the challenge at this point, just to make sure they're current and up to date because a tutorial made last month, uh, the tool might change and they have an update. And so, yeah, that's... Because um, I thought that was a fabulous Yeah, thing. yeah. It's a great, great thing. I have a question. Um, I'm very interested in differentiated learning, and as you mentioned a minute ago, meeting kids yep. where they're at. Sure. So I don't know if you've had a chance to sort of assess how we're doing on that front. I mean, I'm, I'm sure technology plays a big role there. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on how we're doing on that and, and or where we're going. Well, I think a lot of the, the tools that we already have in place are sort of differ differentiating, learning, differentiating learning. Like, for instance, those Osmos, right? That, that, that's sort of a center that... Um, you know, for kids who, you know, maybe have already uh, finished with um, learning one particular topic and the teacher needs to work particularly with another group, maybe they're having a harder time, they can sort of send these kids off to do some more exploration. Um, those Osmos, they can learn coding, they can learn um, all sorts of things. Um, Canvas, too, is a great tool to um, differentiate learning. Um, teachers can sort of have their class as sort of a, a blended learning experience. So to give kids options um, to explore things they're passionate about or to, to explore some more advanced skills. Um, just the actual, um, you know, Chromebooks. Even in the third grade class, I heard, you know, a, a teacher told me that with her third graders, sometimes if, they, you know, one particular group, maybe they're doing, they're reading something, but the other group, the kids are watching a little video about something, learning about it on their own, and then, you know, uh, doing another exercise to sort of uh, evaluate whether or not they understood the video. So mm -hmm. I think it really lends itself to di differentiated learning, and um, I don't know if that Yeah, that's great. Your question. And are you going to be working with the principals on, on budgets for technology? I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Keep us posted. Let us know what you need. We're great. here to help. All right. And I understand that next year Algonquin is going to be um, is going to be a bring your own device. We we are right? moving yeah. in that direction. We're okay. trying to you know, put put things in place in order for that to happen. Um, yeah. We still need to work out some details, but we're definitely exploring that. We're we have a few teachers piloting it right now, and okay, yeah. Is, thank you very thank much. You. That oh, was yeah. great. Okay. It was great to have the update. Thanks for having me. Um, the next item on the agenda is the Summer Enrichment Program. Equally exciting, this is a new launch for us, and I'm going to turn this over to Greg. So we're very excited to share it with um, the community that we're launching a Summer Enrichment Program for Northboro and Southboro. Um, it's a three-week program with a focus of STEAM, so Science and Technology, Engineering, Arts and Mathematics. Um, it's uh, three-week modules. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how um, families sign up their children. They can sign up for one week, two weeks, or all three weeks. Um, each day there is our two sessions, so parents can choose to sign up for one session or both sessions. And there are varying uh, programs for students in grades K through 8. Um, all of these classes are taught by North Pro and South Pro educators. And this year the program will be hosted at Trondia School. Um, and our goal is to start small and to have um, su some success this summer and really expand it in the future years. Um, and the programs uh, range from um, marvelous math to media literacy to robotics to um, literacy theater, so a lot of great opportunities for students. We're hoping to um, communicate this to the community um, in the next few days. That is the goal. Um, if not, by Friday, um, right when we return from vacation, so parents can take a look at the offerings and make a decision around signing up right. their children. So we're very excited, and we're hopeful that it will be a success. So just a, so this is different than our normal summer 
programs for children. So, so this is a this new is, incremental program. This is outside of our ESY that, program. Mm -hmm. That's Correct. right. That we're actually charging a small, a very nominal. I see. Very. And this is open to anyone in the district. Correct, and it is also it's um, self-funding, so it doesn't impact our operational budget. It's fee-based. Wow. Cool. I think it's awesome. I yeah. love now, this. Now, what are the ideas? I mean, this is really good. I, didn't I also would like to thank yeah. Sandy Scordato, who mm -hmm. is an instructional technology specialist here at um, Trotter School, who's yeah. really helped um, work closely with me and, and bring this to fruition. So behind the scenes, there um, has been some great minds. Yeah. Um, and she is definitely one person who's kind of helped had this initiative. And about how many um, how many educators will be involved in this? Do we know? So we have about 30 um, teachers, teachers. Who, who are interested, showed an interest in teaching classes. Because we just don't know how this where this might go. I mean, you could end up with a much bigger enrollment than you ever thought, or you know, as long as as long as it gets out there, you know, it, it gets so, it properly out. So we started by asking teachers what they might be interested in teaching. So we solicited interest first. Yeah. And all of the selections that you see here are based on teachers' interests of what they wanted to teach, given the framework of STEAM. Um, and we also have <coughs> done the math and understand what we need to do to generate revenue to make this yeah. a self-funding program. So, and, and how are you going to? Um, what are we going to do to <coughs> get the word to the public on this? How are we, how are we going to? What's is there any kind of a plan or to I think promote it? So well, we're gonna well for us, I mean, I, you know, you know I, we're going to use retired school committee members. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to go door to door. That's what happens when you ask too many questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we're, uh, oh. <laughs> so we're going to primarily communicate through our website and through the principal's communications yep. to families. We're really trying to target our yeah. school age children. So. It, and I'd even yeah. say even this would be something we even the, the town blog I think yep. would be more than happy to put something like this out there because I, I think know. this just putting this out there. <coughs> yeah. 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 I, yeah I mean, this yeah. could be I, very successful. I would, I would just comment and I don't want to rush don't rush anything but um, I, I as somebody who's signing up for camps <laughs> is some camps are already like we're, committed we're past you know, yeah so just so that <laughs> yeah. people yeah. are choosing between like the rec department camp or right. this um, the early bird ends pretty yeah. soon which I think a lot of people try to make so and we are partnering so, uh, you know we've had conversations okay. with the rec department about how we can collaborate together yeah um, and there's a lot of logistics in terms of um, setting up a revolving account and all those other yeah. pieces where we want to make sure it's it's well thought out and vetted yep. and that when parents sign up it's it's a one-time sign-up feature, so yeah. we're trying to. Move this is great. As quickly I think, this as possible. Is a but idea. I think it is great. You do have it's a really good point cool. about the because I remember it's a long time ago now, but yeah, yeah. you know that, that basically you, you signed up for summer camps in April. Yeah. You know, so it's yeah, yep. th that's one thing that we could be. Yeah, in the future, our January, February is yeah. our timeline to. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a great idea. It is. I, I think it's. Too. I think it is. They sound like really great programs. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Put me together. I would have liked it. Put me together. You need to tell me about these major restrictions. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a sidebar. Greg and I were presenting. Greg was presenting this, and I said, "Oh, I'd like to take these some of these." And he said. Um, Ms. Johnson, I will remind you there's an age restriction, <laughs> and you've, I you've clearly like surpassed the numbers. Right. I, like that. Really I, I like the <laughs> Zumba <laughs> Espanol. Yeah. <laughs> well, th thank you, Greg. Yep. Yeah. Escape room challenge. I know. He took one of those. <laughs> and the next item is the legislative update. There, have been, there has been a lot of uh, activity and many opportunities to meet with our um, legislative team uh, throughout this past month and, or so. And I know Paul has spearheaded several of the gatherings. So I, I don't know if Mr. Desmond would like to comment. I certainly Yeah, we had a good meeting. Uh, me know. I guess two good meetings. Um, first one with uh, Representative Dykema, <coughs> and there were school committee members from Southboro, uh, Northboro, Southboro, Kathleen, uh, Holliston, and Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. you know, all of which she represents. So that was two or three weeks ago, and it just delved on to all kinds of areas that, that were really outside of her expertise. So she uh, took the initiative to invite Alice Peich, who is uh, co-chair of the House what is it? Education, Education Committee. 
and she's from Wellesley, so she was good enough to meet with us just the other day, um, and that was a very interesting discussion. I mean, I, I guess I should probably apologize for all the harsh words I said about the uh, the legislature, about the circuit breaker, mm -hmm. the tobacco, because they, that really was kind of, it blindsided them too, and I, I learned a little more about how circuit breaker um, funding happens, and it's, it's basically based on estimates for the last five years, and they just came in higher for some reason. Usually that works pretty well. <clears throat> so anyway, that messed them all up. It wasn't their fault. <laughs> but, uh, you know, on the other hand, you don't come away with a warm and fuzzy feeling that things are going to get a lot better anytime soon. Especially there's a lot of um, tax implications. There's, a, I guess, two <laughs> potentially ballot questions. One, uh, to lower the sales tax from 6.25% down to 5 which would be fairly devastating for the state. And um, another <coughs> one, <coughs> the so-called millionaire's tax is in danger of not being on the ballot. That passed two constitutional conventions the last two years. The last step is a ballot vote you know, in November. But there's some group that's challenging the, the legality of the ballot question, the way it's worded or something. So if they succeed in knocking that off the ballot, then that's about $2 billion that we won't be getting. And, and another thing she said was, if one of those succeeds and the other doesn't, it's mm -hmm. like a wash. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, the those were my big takeaways, I guess, but. Yeah, the good news, um, Greg and, um, and I attended another uh, legislative breakfast, and it actually was interesting because we had representation from across the Commonwealth because it was the Regional School Association that sponsored that and the regional schools, you know, represent districts that we may not otherwise be at the table with on a, on a regular basis. And so to hear sort of the global perspective, the Massachusetts landscape perspective from, you know, our, um, our counterparts on the western part of Massachusetts was pretty eye-opening for us. And so the focus, again, even at um, the regional level, is about circuit breaker and transportation reimbursement, which actually is um, and does impact the K-8 system. Um, digging more deeply into bus routes, bus stops, and bus costs, um, we find that a bus uh, cost to the K-8s would double if there wasn't regional transportation. So if we pay a daily rate of $150 for a bus at the K-8 level, it would be the equivalent of $300 should uh, we not have the benefit of tearing off of regional. So that would double our transportation costs at the K-8 level. So that was a very interesting conversation. But on the upside, uh, Tom Scott, who is the executive director of the Superintendents Association, sent some very enthusiastic um, communications, and, and Tom is is a dynamic individual but not always enthusiastic and so to see and to receive a letter that says yahoo um, is um, exciting and promising and that was you know that it looks like uh, at this point with just one vote pending um, I think in the Senate that circuit breaker would be back to point, uh, 72 percent three percent shy of what we had hoped it would have been or what we would what it you know, was what led us to believe when we were preparing our budgets. But, you know, 72 is better than 65, and that would be sort of retro to FY18, and that would be the number that they at least minimally would move forward uh, with in FY19. Um, in terms of the transportation, which, again, does impact the K-8s, um, again, requesting slight movement but not hoping, you know, hoping for more but not but being realistic and not anticipating. Uh, the extraordinary relief... Um, Circuit breaker um, applications have been uh, submitted, and we're waiting to see what the government, uh, the governor, does with that, and whether there's actually a tie-in to that 72% reimbursement for circuit breaker. So, you know, so we're waiting, but I think this is as close as we've um, been to seeing um, an increase. Another calculation that really affects um, the budget process mostly for our towns, which indirectly and directly affects us, but definitely at the regional, regional level, is the request to set the minimum local contribution rates sooner and leave them alone. And I think that was the message mostly to the legislative uh, branch and, and our representatives, which is, 
you know, we need those numbers to be solid and they can't fluctuate once we build our budget because for, for many districts, it is devastation and at best, it's reductions in other line items in order to meet any reductions in transportation and, and circuit breaker relief. So if you set them, leave them because we can't, we can't um, afford those great fluctuations in our budgets once approved. Mm -hmm. But um, <coughs> lots and lots of conversation and a lot of people out, I think more this year than I've experienced in the, in the last seven plus, that people are very uh, mobilized, they're very active, and their voices are being heard, and, um, and more than heard, they're being listened to. So really great conversations. <coughs> No, I neglected to mention that Greg Martineau was there at the mm -hmm. meeting with Alice Peich, too, and he brought up a lot of good points, I thought. Yeah. Um, and she seemed to be receptive to, uh, I think, all of them. But um, I don't know if you want to talk about any of those, Greg. No, I think we also talked about um, some flexibility about being more innovative. Yep. That, you know, these policies that are cover blanket <coughs> policies that cover all districts, regardless if you're a level five underperforming or a level one high performing. Um, we'd like some more flexibility to think about innovation and how mm -hmm. we can really meet the needs of our of our student population in innovative ways. And she was, I think, very receptive and wanted to hear more specifics about our thinking. Yep. You all set? That's all I got. The next item is the town meeting recap. And our budget passed. That's it. Yes. <laughs> At a track. We're going to start spending it now. Yeah, I, it was a wonderful town meeting. Yeah. Our budgets passed <coughs> with, with no holds. As did all the others. As did yeah, the yeah, others. I don't think that's ever happened. I just sat breathing after the school. Whether they, you know, it's great. They, they they, it's yeah, wonderful. I don't, I don't recall mm -hmm. yeah, I don't. to take it through. With no. Not I was holding. just. Yeah. I think the whole place was kind of looking good, but that really happened. Well, there's a big round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got to the point where nobody wanted to break the chain. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's good because we were at the end. We were last, so that's so great. That's, yeah. In theory, I hope it holds every month, every every meeting. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah ever. It was good. Yeah, it was good. It was a good town meeting. Very positive energy, I think, in, the, in yeah. the auditorium. Not just about the budgets, but. Right. Really? Mostly. <laughs> Um, under old business, kindergarten transition update. Uh, no new information. Uh, the process still remains the same. We're looking at total enrollment. Uh, that's known at so some time in, throughout the summer. It fluctuates. And last year, we did make the final decisions in terms of what the tuition reimbursement, uh, the um, tuition would be based on the total enrollment, the amount of staff and the extent to which we will be relying on revolving funds to offset what's not appropriated in the operational budget. I'm very optimistic that we will be able to meet our projections, which would be to um, transition to 83% on the operational budget with a reduction of tuition in the neighborhood of $2,000. And so from 3250 in two years to that point, I think it's, it's phenomenal. And our goal will be again, I'm sure, next year as we look at our priorities to continue that positive trajectory and, um, and try to make this a reality within that three to five year time frame. And it's very likely that we will be able to do that. Very good. Okay. Um, next item is the public safety building update. Well, there's some good news here, and then there's some interesting news. So the good news is that we are moving forward. We've met again, I think um, Principal Mucci shared at our last meeting that we had met with the design firm, and um, we determined that because of the conversations moving forward with respect to milling and repaving the entire area, our costs, our overall costs are not yet known, and that a lot of what those costs will be will um, best be known once the DPW superintendent submits her bids for the work that she is planning to do this summer. 
and <coughs> we will pee back on those savings as a consolidated RFP for pavement and that if we need to phase fin uh, phase Woodward over two years that being the the change of the entryway the wall the park the re um, assignment of the parking spaces and then the um, connectivity to the public safety building which looks like it will be sometime after we do our work and then the second year look at paving um, and milling milling and paving uh, that will be determined probably in the summer as to whether or not we can afford that all in one year or do we want to phase it over a year and a half and as we know we're using a lot of our um, our um, receipts our revolving fund and balancing some of that with the operational budget I think we're in good shape um, I remember Mary Beth's statement the last time I said well our invoice so far on the design fees was about 8500 and I think Mary Beth said really I was expecting it to be about 25,000 so um, you're closest without going over because the, the, <laughs> ne the next bid um, um, I'm not sure if the price is right but you're closest without going over uh, because of the additional work the survey work that needs to be done and the redesigning of the wall and so forth um, we're at about 22.5 we have a new audience <laughs> member um, just yeah. once to Oh. oh. So even though my volume is off, yeah. I'm sorry. It happens. Okay. It's little relief. <coughs> Commercial breaks are good. So um, it's about 22.5, but it would have been it's work that we would have had to do regardless of the project. So we're paying it sooner than than later, and uh, we're still pleased with the. I think the response from VHB, which is the um, architect and some of the um, consultant work that the town is using. I think the um, we have great confidence in continuing our collaboration with the town so on the project so where we can realize some savings through the work that the town is doing in that area we're certainly continuing those conversations we know now that the town is providing the gate which we originally thought was going to come under our cost for the project so um, you know I'm sure the gate is hopefully not the end but just the start of the continued savings and as we learned the other evening, the public safety building is moving forward with some favorable costs. So hopefully that will trickle our way so as well. Just put the little Mary driveway. Just dump the asphalt a little farther to the left. So, and we're working with the rec too because, um, as we saw from our pa little paper, transparent paper there, tracing paper that we had up on the screen, we are um, redesigning the basketball and location <coughs> reconfiguring that so we're making sure that the work that we do is timed well with the rec to um, this summer it's exciting okay. next item on the agenda is school start time uh, I'm not sure if anyone on the committee wants to comment on this first um, we had a great discussion at combined and um, from my office we're continuing to assess and evaluate um, the routes uh, we had and bus stops as originally planned uh, NRT which is uh, North Reading Transit that's our bus company was uh, in this afternoon and we spent about three hours with them just going over um, some options and at this point you know continuing to to look for possibilities mm -hmm. and I think um, good conversation and a lot of good work and some potential for some innovative um, options moving forward we've turned over to them all of our routes uh, this year and they will be working on rooting the three districts next week and for Southboro even separate from start time in within the context of the conversations we've been having um, another start time discussion somewhat <coughs> connected is um, the start time and what's going to need to be a little bit flexible if given all the construction that's going to be taking say, place in town oh, it's going to be awful though. So having them do this ahead of schedule, um, 
even if it wasn't the start time discussion that we were having as a sort of a general conversation, having them do this now will be fantastic for us in Southboro because we're not opening up our schools and trying to figure out the routes. We'll be tweaking based on the construction that will be taking place in Southboro. I wonder, will you be able to kind of coordinate, is it Karen Gallagher or mm -hmm. who it's going to be to kind of say, you know, giving her, here's our bus routes, here's our time, and, you know, what's the construction going to be to get ahead of, you know, what are we going to have to reroute, what are we going to have to ex mm. take more time on, because I, I mean, there was the one little Verizon truck there, and, yeah, that you was, know, the construction was, yeah. I mean, the cars were way down the road, and yeah. I just thought, oh, it was, gosh. It was back it's, up to Westboro, really, when they, yeah. they, they, they were hardly doing anything. Yeah. And I was like, you haven't even begun. So, so it's going to really impact, I mean, especially what, yeah, you're just laughing because it's really <laughs> Woodworth. It. Yeah, you know, I'm going to buy a moped and just come yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. Trail. Come in that <laughs> back. Fine. Everybody. So I just think it's going to be something that if the town's, we're going to have to like beat into the town like you need, you're going to impact the schools. So you need to communicate that ahead of time. So even Karen was a little disappointed that some of the construction would not happen until we were already in session. But there is definitely a commitment that we will be all sitting around the table trying to work out this yeah. this situation as soon as it's known. Um, S um, Southboro Extended Day was um, <coughs> visiting with me this week, and it's just just so wonderful that all of the organizations in town that provide opportunities for students continue to work together. You know, Greg um, has done such phenomenal work with the summer enrichment program and. You know, even the extended day program has committed to make sure that there's options. These these options are available for the students who are in the extended day program, and you know that mutual support and flexibility. Um, and the conversation with extended day was, mm, are you aware that might there might be some later buses and later students arriving to extended day? So they'll be at the table with us as well because parents rely on on their services to provide care for students. So they'll be part of the process. I think there's going to be a lot of conversations, not yet known about what, except transportation and times taking place. Um, so I have a question. Um, so, so next year is probably going to be a mess, right? So that's not the year to think about switching start times anywhere and adjusting everything and a Correct. reliable schedule. What probably. What is the goal for? After that, is the is is the goal to try to work toward one of the options that came up in the last in the combined meeting, which is to move everything by 20 minutes, or is the goal for the high school by 20 minutes and the rest of the schools by not as much, or is the goal to figure out a way to get the high school to start even later than that, in which case it probably would have a greater impact on the K through eight schools. So. I, so I, I think the goal is to continue and you know, I think it's a bigger discussion than just what I <coughs> what my takeaway was from that meeting. But my takeaway from that meeting was that the amount of enthusiasm for a twenty minute um, change in start time at the high school was not necessarily there. That in fact, um, the discussion was can we do something more innovative <clears throat> that would include perhaps a consideration of change of time at the high school with minimal impact on the K-8s and what does that look like and I, I believe that part of that conversation was in order for us to realize something far more global in, in nature and scope and impactful for teaching and learning at, at the high school level and uh, providing our students with greater options and opportunities that it's more than just taking a look at the time. It's looking at how we can provide a greater scheduling um, option for students, which may include expanding the day and it may include changing the start time. Okay. And um, the, the notion that I'm moving forward on in the meantime, while the high school has all of those conversations, which are very important, and take some time to get it right because there's so many uh, factors to consider it's so multifaceted and with any re um, any change of a high school schedule it is about a two-year process without even exploring innovative uh, educational opportunities so 
I'm moving forward with the bus company to continue to explore the options of moving start time, not impacting K-8, minimal cost. So tonight I shared the true cost of a bus that would be um, something that the K-8s would look at if we tiered off separately. But some of the conversations have been, okay, if we consolidate stops, right now the bus stops, which will change and have uh, practice a little bit and lots of conversations. How much time do we save? Um, you know, what is our tiering off at each level and what does that look like? Um, and we're making some headway. We're making some, some good progress. I think having the bus company take charge of, of adjusting our routes, 90% of that coming from the bus company this soon, um, gives us a lot of opportunities to take a look. So it, the, it was highly unlikely that we would have been able to do anything by 2019, the fall, this fall. And I've had conversations with Extended Day. Um, they sort of wiped their tears when they thought that um, all of the postings that they've seen here and there were actual facts that we were going to change the schedule because they basically said, I, I, I don't know how we can respond that quickly. We can't. It's significantly changing our staffing. It's significantly changing who's going to be available for the students. It would have a significant impact on the number of hours that we would be able to provide services such that depending on what happened in the morning, they may have to cancel their entire morning options. So they need that time, as do all of the organizations that support our students in and out of the school day, mm -hmm. yeah. just to adjust. That makes sense. So, um, I'm, I'm very excited about today's conversation. So, so is the idea, I'm sorry, because I maybe I think too linear, too much in a linear way, but is, so is the idea to, to figure out a way to move the high school by 20 minutes no. mm -hmm. while also then looking at larger changes down the road? Like, so the conversations with the bus companies are, right now are to figure out. How much, what? if any time? Yeah. The 20 minutes, I, um, I don't want to put words in the school committee's mouth, but my assumption is the 20 minutes is basically off the table. Yeah. The determination okay. was if we're going yeah. to go through all of this and have a lot of folks impacted for 20 minutes, okay. that that's not a, a real meaningful mm -hmm. amount of minutes. Okay. Um, so it's effort versus outcome. And, and the effort and, and the resulting sort of upheaval uh, to a, for a lot of folks for 20 minutes may not necessarily be the direction that we want to go. Okay. 20 minutes was suggested as something that we could realistically um, target as a manageable amount of time mm -hmm. if we did consolidation of stops and all of those kinds of things and looked at how we tier. Um, in some cases, our students are held on the bus um, before they are, um, before the school day begins. So when they, when they arrive at a, a bus, at a school, um, they're not able to disembark right away, and that's sometimes due to coverage in the morning. And if we looked at and had some great conversations with our administrative team, is there a way for us to get coverage in the morning so that we switch teacher duties? And so all of those conversations would take place, and 20 minutes could have potentially been a doable option. It's off the table, and so the two directions that we're moving is what can we realistically do um, and then what do we really want to do as a major shift in the way we deliver teaching and learning at high school. So we heard Julie mention a little earlier um, about the blended learning model. You know, those are things that we want to explore and how can they be embedded in the school day. Um, we know that um, providing our students with choice because even though the research suggests one thing, some students do prefer getting up early in the oh, morning. And, like, you know, one of the things that Southboro Extended Day yeah. said to me when they visited was that, you know what, if this changes, we, ha we have a lot of students who, who work for Extended Day, high school mm -hmm. students, because they are the ones who are providing mm -hmm. the tutoring to the youngest students, they're closest to the new curriculum. And so that would change. Mm -hmm. um, so it, there's a lot of pieces yeah, to this, mm -hmm. but we have continually throughout this period engaged in a very healthy dialogue about what are our options 
but have been realistic about not just the financial implications, but the life changing, uh, uh, you know, for parents and for students. Yeah. So it's it's an exciting opportunity. It is a challenge, and we haven't um, given up, and we won't. It's still worth exploring. And today, we took a, a very um, I don't want to say radical, but we, we, we changed the box that we've been looking from and at Julie's lens, we changed the focus a little and, and started with a whole different mindset about what the day would start like with our buses. So mm -hmm. they, yeah. have the, they have the challenge in front of them, the bus company now, and they're going to make their own Rubrics Cube and see if we can do something about that. And one, just one last thing. So have they done this with other districts, do you know? Is this they, um, there are very few regional school districts that are configured like we are to begin with. Um, and there are very few regional schools that have successfully, successfully changed uh, the start time. Um, I think uh, 15 have actually, not regional, 15 school districts in Massachusetts have changed their start time. Many of those are districts that have cha that changed years ago, and they were able to do that. NASA is a regional district on the Cape. Um, they've changed the start time, but their geographic distribution of students that attend that regional school really played a big p a part of why they were able to do that. So there are about 15 school districts that have been able to change the start time out of the to 351 cities in town and 262 districts or something. So it's a challenge. But we like challenges and we are persistent when it's for good. So we are persistently embracing the challenge. Thank you. Hey, and I just want to say something too, Christina. You've been working on this for years mm -hmm. and years. Yeah. And I just want to say how much we appreciate all the work you've done that it's been in front of the school committees for the whole time that I've been here, yeah. and we have tried and tried to come up with some reasonable solution, and it's just been very difficult. Um, and it's not, it's not the fault of anyone, it's just it's a difficult problem to solve. And last year, uh, recently when we determined that, that the 20 minutes wasn't good enough, that kind of means you go right back to the beginning. I mean, you, you don't kind of like start there and continue forward. I think we're right back to the drawing board, and, and I know how difficult that is, and I just want you to know how much I appreciate how much, how I hard you've worked on this for years and, and years now. So, and that a lot of people have put a lot of time and a lot of effort in. Right. It's, it's and been a, a lot team of information about it. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Team discussion. I actually brought the, this, this is, um, I just wanted to do a visual. This is actually all these little tabs here are the amount of times we've had discussions at one or more school committees. So, okay. we keep adding to the tabs, and that's okay. good. We have lots of post it notes. We'll add another tab for tonight. But really, it has been something that a lot of folks have been talking about. We clearly know what the research suggests. And you know, we're, we're still going to continue the, the good discussion. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, changing your pair of glasses and looking at it in a different way is kind of exciting. And, and that's what we're doing now with the bus company. And um, they're excited to answer your question. Um, we, we talked to him today. and. You know, the general consensus was, whoa, if this works, you have something to market <laughs> to every regional school district. So we're hoping that okay. we move from possible to probable today. Amazing. Yeah. Great. Awesome. <coughs> Thank you all, Thank too. You. I know this is something that's a challenge for you because you get the calls and you get the questions, and we all would like to be able to do whatever we can, you know, in the snap of the finger but we just had superintendents good work <laughs> <laughs> and I say go ask the school committee so it's all good. Yeah. It's all good. So thank you. <clears throat> and next item on the agenda is enrollments. Enrollments in your packet. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we keep watching our <laughs> kindergarten numbers so that we can uh, make That's some annoying. decisions. Yeah, about that. They're a little bit lower, but it's early and people move in July and still, August. Mm. You still think they're out there? 135. Yeah, they will come. We, we <laughs> built it, so they will come. Huh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And um, also, a lot of people just forget to register, don't they? Mm -hmm. we, we have a few that we're still in contact with that okay. we're trying to solidify. Okay. Uh, but most, most have. 
Oh, okay. So more the move-ins or whatever. We see a preschool increase, right, though? Did we see it? We saw a slight increase in preschool. In preschool, yes. And obviously, they move from preschool to kindergarten, so that's good not for continued enrollment. Mm -hmm. And um, also in the packet is the um, FY18 monthly general fund expenditure report. Um, again, a vote to approve until audited. You know, it's, and it's amazing, after town meeting, it's like, okay, we're done with 18. Let's just start thinking about spending <laughs> 19, but we're really not, and we have so much work um, to be done in, in, in two months, and um, we're keeping a watchful eye over our balance as well. So we need a motion. <coughs> mm -hmm. I'll move, move that we, uh, uh, I'll let Roger move. Go ahead. We move to approve the uh, FY 2018 budget uh, as of March 31, 2018 contingent on the audit. Second. All in favor? Motion passes. It, uh, except for May 9th. Uh, I know. This, this is, it's always um, amazing to watch this grow. Yeah. And in September, you wonder, will we ever fill up this page? And then when you get to this point, we say, did we fill up this page with all those meetings? So, yes, we did. And again, another great budget process. Ready to start? Not right now, but again, another page in September. I do want to make note of the elections uh, for our May 8th. So at our next meeting, um, unfortunately, or um, not unfortunately that we won't be welcoming new folks, but again, it's the last night with Jerry and Mary Beth. Yeah. You're smiling, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to miss you guys. Yeah. As soon as they deliver Greg's uh, packets, then they'll be joining, the distributing, right? I think you put them to work on the summer enrichment program first. Here we go. And I guess educational policy, there is none at this time. And policy development and distribution. So the winter season has not been kind to the policy subcommittee. <laughs> We've had a couple of cancellations due to weather. Um, but we did have our last meeting on March 22nd, so we, we hit the ground run, running in spring. Um, and we have a number of first reads uh, for the committee. Um, just a couple of notes. Um, E210, school-based public access defibrillation program. Um, J120, school immunization requirements. J220, dispensing and medication. And J340, head injury and concussions policy. Um, came out of policy, uh, health and wellness policy subcommittee and also legal counsel. Um, so they also were re reviewed at the policy subcommittee meeting on um, March 22nd. Um, at the, the 22nd, we also looked at um, J110, recruiting and hiring personnel. Um, Becky Pellegrino, human resource administrator, and legal counsel took a close look at that. Okay. Um, I-240, class size um, is a first read. And um, I-340, new religious observance policy, came out of the um, combined policy meeting. And um, be happy to answer any questions or if the committee would like to take some time to review those. Mm -hmm. I just, it's more of clarification. So I see a lot of, um, it's to strengthen the Southborough Public Schools, and we changed a lot of that to the public schools of Northborough and Southborough. But does that make sense if Northborough Public Schools have their own policy, Southborough Public Schools have their own policy they vote on, and the region, they're the, what are they? Algonquin Regional. So should ours just say the Southborough Public Schools because it's only a policy? I don't know. Or is this? Right? Because it's there's three different ones. Superintendent Johnson. Assistant Superintendent Martin. I think, you know, so we've gone back and forth yeah. with this. It just doesn't make sense to me that a right. Southboro Public School policy uses the Northboro in it. Well, unless, not. unless these are intended to encompass. But there's no policy that oversees the three. There's three separate committees that each have a different policy manual. 
So I think this is um, an excellent okay. point that we should probably come to some consensus. Yeah. Just wondering. More. On, and I think the chat, the reason it sort of moved and gravitated to the public schools of North Pro and South Pro um, was due to the fact that we would come together when we created new policies. Right. And, and then we used the public schools of North Pro mm -hmm. and South Pro. But in reality, each committee yeah. votes separately. Right. So we could, and, and maybe this is a discussion in June mm -hmm. when we finally. Mm -hmm. yeah approve these policies with everyone at the table I'm agree more from a legality right there is there really an entity called the public schools of north borough and south borough i mean there's that's mm. the union there isn't but there's the north borough public schools right. the south borough public schools not gotham i don't think there's an entity legal and more thinking from a, a legal standpoint that someone could come back I, I, I'm I think, wondering. I think that in the in the years uh, doing sharing pol doing policies now that we, we try to simplify things too. And so administratively, we, we've tried to keep it as simple as we can totally. for these guys. That's and all. I, oh, I get it. So, so they don't oh, have to I'm have more three thinking, and I love the idea that, yeah. and I think it's been wonderful in the last couple of years that we sort of bring the three committees together because if everybody has yeah. to have a head injury and concussion policy. The administration should not have to sit with three committees. Right. You can all come to one. I'm really just saying that then when somebody mm -hmm. goes to the word to the Microsoft Word, they do one version that says Northboro, mm -hmm. one that says Algonquin, and one that says Southboro, and store them separately. More only only if it's legal. Just more. I don't know. It was just my question. So it, um, I don't know. I happen to agree that, and and where it comes up is when there's a difference of wording in a policy that one of the reasons we're bringing all of these back to each of the three um, we committees is because each committee can if they choose despite the fact that we we at central office would really enjoy having the language consistent because sometimes it's a nuance of just a ah and the da Okay. in a policy um, but in reality each committee does vote for its yeah. own policy and maintain, book it's more and maintain. maintains it each so other if I if it's I think question. it's a great conversation to have yeah. at the school committee off, offline yeah. just check with somebody it's more we can check with legal and for yeah. us it would be a replace all as long exactly. as all the language was consistent exactly. replace the public schools of Northboro with yeah. the public schools of Northboro the public right. schools of Southboro and the public, the Northboro Southboro Regional School District. Right. Those are the official entities. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was more thinking. Those are the legal entities. So the, there's, I, I think, right. at least two conversations here, okay. or two, maybe even two and a half. Um, the half is, in addition to not, um, for the administration to have to meet with the policy committees, you know, there's certainly uh, um, more time-consuming, challenging, and then take one, but also to administer the policy. I mean, when you're talking about the fibula of the policy, you know, if you, if, if, if you have confidence that these policies are the same, I won't even mm -hmm. say similar, um, there's really not much hesitation. Yeah. <laughs> if you start to get into different policies for mm -hmm. those kinds of issues, mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you know, maybe rapid response, uh-oh, well, let's see. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think there's a good reason <laughs> to try to... I think it's great. It's um, more than that. I'm just saying how's it supposed right, to be to, to try to make things consistent, if at all operationally possible. Now, legal is legal. Yeah. And even if legal says, we with Mary, Mary Beth, and that, well, because there's, it's not really a legal entity, you have to have... Um, South Pro schools, North Pro schools, regional school, but even if even if that's what we're required to do, it still makes a lot of sense for the policies to be the same. Mm -hmm. And the only change, unless there's real issues, is okay. Um, it says South Pro here, it says North Pro here, but the administration has comfort that they know what the policy is. Right. Yeah, that's totally. So that's I think a goal, that, mm -hmm. which may or may not be able to be achieved. But I think that should be the goal of all the stuff. Right. Well, I was just asking it, about that. Yeah. No, it's, it's a good question because we've only really done the use the wording of North Pro, South Pro public schools on a handful of. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? It's only been done on a handful of, of uh, policies where they really there really wasn't going to be a lot of discussion about us being different than yeah, North Pro's. Right. Now, now, if you look through here, you can see it on the, the policy book that there are many policies where there really are some differences. 
And when we go through those, we might look at Northwells and say, no, we, we don't agree with that. And, and uh, you know, we, we, those, are not, those are not the numbers that we would look at to be able to class size. Right, right. And in that case, we would never do that. But it, there was just a handful. Oh, yeah. Some of them were health-related no. ones, too. Mm -hmm. So many of them yeah. are required by the yeah. law. And, and I'm not, I think it's great. I, I do yeah. think we've streamlined and it's been wonderful. I'm more just asking if that's legal. And, and, yeah. and the combined notion came about yeah more so because we were asked to create new policies. <coughs> so in the creation of the new policies, right. um, we came together to create that new language. Yeah. So yeah. that great. At, the, at, right off, at the start, we were sort of united. And it, it from like the comments there. from school committee members, it was nice to hear other perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and so at a challenging point where we were trying to create a new policy, as, as we will be with the rewriting of the acceptable use policy, it makes no sense to have three different acceptable use policies because it is hard to, administrator, to administer. But you want the language to be consistent if you're putting the energy into having it researched by council and reviewed by our tech teams and so forth. Unless there's significant nuances, you wouldn't have it changed. Um, and we created the, um, the response to Bill 222 language and the um, the policy for the opioid, the religious observance, I mean, we've had some really in-depth conversations. So to be able to have everyone there when we create a new policy is phenomenal. Um, and then we've, we, it, it sort of spun out into a meeting as policy subcommittees um, individually. And if we had just reviewed a policy in, by, um, in another district, and had it reviewed by the Health and Wellness Committee and had it reviewed by legal counsel. We always kept those attached to any consideration uh, we might want to give to those when we're sitting with any of the three subcommittees. And in many cases, it was, yeah, we like this language. It makes good sense. We'll, we'll choose to keep that. But it would be the Southboro School, Northboro School District. So I think I think it's working really well, yeah, except we kind of want to get our arms around whether we want to use the public schools of Northboro and Southboro at all on any of the policies, or do we want to do as you suggested? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds. We're getting yeah, the exactly. consistent language, yep. and now yeah. do we just want to identify each policy by each specific district? So, so <clears throat> you're administering this. Um, and I'm curious, let's, let's, I'm curious if having some way to know, even if, even if, even if for some reason legal counsel says you really have to have Southboro, you have to, you have to describe these, read these districts as um, unique entities, unique entities. Uh, you still could potentially have some policies that said, well, this is for this entity, this entity, and this mm -hmm. entity. So when you're trying to administer this and you look at a policy, you immediately know, okay, this is, you know, we don't have to worry about this versus that versus the other. Mm -hmm. um, this is all encompassing versus those, however number of policies there may be that are going to be different. I mean, just thinking of trying to administer this thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think all, right. yeah, and I think that you know, um, effectiveness. And Christine, I think, um, when she was assistant superintendent, came up with a master chart of North Pro, South Pro, North Pro, South Pro. So it's something we easily acknowledge where policies are. There's parity with policy, mm -hmm. and we like to your point. We don't need to read through each policy. It's right. common. Right. It, and I think it's fair to say too that your points are really good, uh, cause, yeah. but. Um, in terms of the North, when it says North Pro and South Pro, public schools North Pro and South Pro, the only policies that have this are the ones that came out of the regional committee, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so that's kind of like, so it's in front of the regional committee. You have, you know, the the high school and the two towns are there, and you're looking at one thing that makes sense to all of you instead of having to hand out different yeah. things to everyone. Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of the way that it's that, that was the way that it it, it started. Right. Um, but whatever people want to do, I guess. I think yeah. that makes perfect sense. I mean, the public schools of North Pro and South Pro is on the website. It's all over the place. So I mean, yeah. I think. Even if someone wants to make a legal issue out of it, I think they'd have a really hard time. Hopefully, I mean, I, will say okay. An alternative <coughs> is maybe just do it with the name 
of the public schools of Southboro, the public schools of Northboro, and then can you just put a note at the end of the policy that just says this policy, you know, this policy has also been adopted by blah, blah, blah. I think and you have a good name idea. Name the other two committees, mm -hmm. and then you have it here. So there's a note, so if you, if, you know, one committee says I want to amend this policy, then you know it's also there's a reference. Yep. A reference, like yeah. an MGL yeah. reference. We can have our own yeah. reference. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, um, so these will come back for a second reading. Um, and we also have a policy uh, recommend to rescind I-210 instructional materials. Um, <clears throat> Very in-depth policy, I noticed. <laughs> yeah, right. That, 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 there was actually a lot of discussion about that one. <laughs> so, so, um, I'm going to make a motion uh, to rescind uh, the instruction material policy I-210. Second. Well, we we'd agreed to do it in our committee, so I'm totally free. Yeah. Any discussion on it? Or no. Do I have a second? I'm good with it. Second? A second. Oh, second. All in favor? Rescinded. If we can go back to the concussion policy for, for a second. Oh, sure. Has um, <coughs> it's supposed to be reviewed and or revised as needed, but at least every two years. So it was adopted in May 2012, and that's it. I don't know. If, I don't know if we do we make a note when it's reviewed but not revised. That master policy sheet we have review dates and policies that need to be reviewed on a, a cycle. Those are um, recorded as well. I mean, I guess the question, has, has it been reviewed since 2012, or is, yes. this, or is this it? Yes. What, okay. what hasn't been added is the citation, because okay. I can remember Lori yeah. Pardee specifically saying, yeah, it's fine, we're not going to make any changes. And so probably because it was that simple that we didn't put it to paper. But she has been very consistent with the one, and it's her language that says we have to review it every two years. So we'll add that to the notation, because we do make a note when it's revised, or, and or reviewed. Okay. So, so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Okay. We have to get Lori to sit in the committee meetings with us so we can remember to do that. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Tonight, I thought all the questions were going to be on the class size policy. but <laughs> We do have a, actually the class size policy, just one note on that particular yeah. policy. Um, in the recommendations, the chart of the actual desirable class size, um, the, the policy um, for desirable class size for grades 3, 4, and 5 was 18 to 22, and the desirable class size for grades 6, 7, and 8 was 16 yeah. to 22. Okay. That was a, an error, um, so we reversed them yeah. to their correct order. It makes more <coughs> sense. It does make more sense. That's a lot of good work. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> we all set? Mm -hmm. um, distribution of personnel report? No personnel changes oh to report. It's two months in a row. That's, it? that is two months in a row. It is great. <laughs> that's, like, that's, that's almost like the town meeting. <laughs> that's right. We're going to go three for three, hopefully. And communications? Just an announcement that the commissioner has changed. And we're anxiously awaiting his appearance at the next um, superintendent's meeting in May. So we'll have some feedback on what his uh, philosophy and vision might be for us as a role. Mm -hmm. So we haven't heard too much from him at this point. So hopefully um, when he presents at the um, MASS meeting in May, we'll be able to bring back some comments. This is a not to miss second annual event by uh, our ELL, um, ELD group and also Rhoda Webb led uh, the first initiative and she promises that this extravaganza will be even, will even be better. I don't know how that's possible, but we'll surpass attendance. Um, and we're excited about, about the second annual event. We warned her last year it was such a success. This could be something that she does every year, and she just, with a smile and great enthusiasm, embraces it wholeheartedly and started planning it almost the, the next night after last, last year's was over. Absolutely. So more will be coming out in the packets and so forth for our administrators to send home. 
And the action on the minutes. <coughs> so we need, we need motions. Oh, I'm sorry, we missed chat. That's right. K through 12 World Language Study Group. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen, no meeting, right? No, the snow. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's snowy. Yeah, but we are scheduled to meet in May. May. The third. Um, no, second. 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 Great. Okay. And we'll need motions on the action of, on the minutes. Is the, um, the executive session just uh, to approve and release? So there's nothing here to approve, right. right? Right. That's approve and release. That's approve and release. That's so all. I'll move that uh, we accept the minutes of the South Coast School Committee Executive Session in uh, Wednesday, March 14, 2018, for approval and please. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? It passes. <laughs> And so we also did we do the, the open meeting? Open meeting? We just did the just did the right, because I thought yeah. I thought right. Mary, Mary Beth, since you're the chairman of the can't do it, should actually make the last yeah. sort of motion of this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. wow. Wow. Well, um, I <laughs> I make a motion we accept the open meeting minutes of Wednesday, March fourteenth, two thousand and eighteen. Second. I'll second. Oh, um. yeah. I take my second. Back. <laughs> <laughs> the chair second. It's my last second. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Motion passes. Well, well, that will be in our minutes. Yeah. This there meeting. we go. And we, now we have approval, bills and payrolls, and agenda items for next month. Matt has a pile of yellow uh, over yellow. there. So okay. And uh, th at this point, it's school choice public hearing and the anxiously awaited Finn School Improvement Plan. Good. And I'm sure there'll be other items, probably another legislative update. Mm -hmm. yeah. And school committee elections? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. School committee elections with new members. So it's the day before the school, the next school meeting. Yeah. Right. So, that, so, so, so the people that win the election, they have to know to get to the town clerk the morning of the school committee, or else you can't attend the meeting. Right. Okay. Get so, Jim Haggerty to come yeah. and swear people. You, in you have to be meeting. sworn in. So when you, you win that happen. night, you, you run to the town, town hall the next morning, <laughs> and they swear you in. Or you can do it that night. You might be able to do it that night if you're there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Jim will be hanging around that night. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and the last item is audience sharing. And we have no. I do. Uh, just a brief comment. I want to thank um, Chief Morrow, Chief Paulus, and Office Landry for being part of the Safe School Readiness mm -hmm. Forum that we held at Algonquin Regional High School. It was just an amazing um, opportunity to um, be joined by not only the um, Fire chief, the police chief, and the school resource officer in in North Bro in Southport, but also uh, North Grove, and it really does speak to the incredible collaboration we have within our town, but also uh, with the boroughs, <coughs> and uh, how much support they've provided to all of us as we continue to enhance our um, safety protocols. Also to the administrative team, um, I think what an incredible. Um, message that uh, was sent by the members because we had representation from K-12. It was a voluntary evening and everyone came and that's because uh, everyone is really invested uh, first and foremost in the safety of our, our students. So thank you to the school committee members who, who came. Uh, it, I just uh, received an email from Kathy Daglish. It's out on YouTube for all those parents who, who really are interested and just could not simply make that event. <coughs> so. Um, it was a, a good informa a good information shared, some great questions from from the audience, and um, I think the feedback was um, was very positive. Uh, also to Clayton and to Steve, uh, before that uh, presentation, 
we had sort of a, a mini safety presentation, but it was certainly maximum information and maximum participation from the Finn and Woodward family, um, hosted by by um, Finn School, but uh, Steve was there as well to really share what takes place at the earliest grades, and I think that really underscored the um, fact that we've customized our protocols to be age appropriate and to be respectful of the concerns that are present at each grade level. So thank you and uh, the good work that um, is all part of providing a safe school environment beyond just our protocols, but a welcoming, nurturing school climate each and every day for our students um, continues. I'd like to echo that. I was at both presentations and I thought they were very well done, really, and well received from everything I heard after, and um, really very informational and um, reassuring, and very, very good. So thank you for all of that. I've got one little thing. <coughs> I wanted to congratulate Keith Lavoy on the, and the rest of the Trotter community on a very successful volleyball marathon. Which, uh -huh. Oh yeah, if I remember the one call correctly, we raised 25,000? No, not that much. No? Um, we hope so. About half that, hopefully. Oh. About the call. That's still a lot. Which is still very good. Yeah, that's a lot of money. So, I, the participation was 83%, which is as good as we've ever done. It stays consistent. And But I think this year was different. We had over 250 students still here at 8 o'clock which has never happened, uh, I can say that for sure. So there was a very spirited eighth grade group that kept it going all the way to the end, and um, you know, it, was, it was just an awesome event, and the parent support, and it's one of the only opportunities that parents get to volunteer at Trotter because our students don't want their parents around. Um, but in this case, they do, and um, it was a great event from beginning to end. So Amy DeShane and uh, Alyssa Adams were our parent organizers, and they did a stellar job from beginning to end, and we're wrapping up tomorrow with a breakfast. Mm -hmm. the homeroom winners, so they'll be enjoying that tomorrow morning. <coughs> Very good. Great. So, I'll make them. Is, do I have a motion to adjourn? I will make a motion to adjourn. Should I, should I second? Yeah. To I'll Kate. second. <laughs> We're adjourning to Kate. <laughs> to Kate. <laughs> All in favor? Meeting adjourned. Gavel. Our last gavel.